The following broadcast is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministry. sermon today, help our fallen and I can get up. You've, you've seen the commercial where the lady falls and she says, help our fallen and I can't get up. But for the message today, I want to encourage you by reminding you that you may have fallen but you can get up. Have, have you ever had something happen to you or to someone you care about and when it happened, it was serious and you were hurt by it? If it was you, you were just uh, traumatized and if it was somebody else that you care about, you were traumatized and I mean, it just, it just touched your heart. But after a while, after it goes on a while and you look back on it, you can laugh at yourself. And you can even laugh and joke with the people who were the victims of whatever it was that happened. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share something with you about myself that I, you know a little bit about, but I'm, I'm going to give you the details. As, as most of you know, I share with you all that I had a fall on February 28th. I told you I fell down the steps. But let me go into a little bit more detail because now I laugh about it and the, and the folk around me pick at me and laugh at me about it. And so I am home babysitting uh, Nicole and Daniel. For those that don't know, Nicole at that point was about 17 months old and Daniel is five. And so Daniel goes upstairs and he says, Papa, you and Nicole come upstairs with me. And I got music in the house blasting, you know. Uh, we are getting our groove on, and so Nicole and I are downstairs. We are dancing, got, you know, getting our dance on. And so I decide to dance on up the stairs. And so as, I, as I'm dancing up the stairs, I get about three-fourths of the way, and something happens, and my feet come out from under me, and all I know is I'm coming down. And, 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 and I'm coming down hard now because this, by the grace of God, some kind of way, because I'm I'm falling forward, but I flip to get Nicole from falling face down. And I got her in my arms, pinned against the wall. Don't know how that happened. But I'm hitting, them, hitting those steps one by one. Boom, boom, boom. Just bouncing in the air. And I get to the bottom, and Daniel just screaming, Papa! And then I get to the bottom, and Nicole hadn't said a word. She's, she's just traumatized. And then when I get to the bottom and come to myself, I shake her. I said, Nicole? And she just started screaming, ah! And then Papa, Daniel said, Papa, are you all right? I said, uh, yeah, just give me a minute. And then take a minute, and I try to get up. I can't get up. I guess, you know, the adrenaline and everything is flowing. I don't feel any pain, but I can't move that hip, that leg. I cannot stand up on it. So I'm trying to be cool. I called Diane in my voice. Uh, Diane, I need you to come home from work to babysit. She says, um, what's the matter? I said, I, I got somewhere I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can you leave? Well, I get off. I, 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 I need you to come before you get off. <laughs> I need you to come right now. She asked me 99 questions. I said, woman, I just fell down the steps <laughs> I can't move. I need you to come home. And, she, and even though she's coming from Dawson, she's not getting there fast enough, so I called Albert. I said, Albert, you need to come over here quick. So he comes in the door. I'm still sitting at the bottom of the step. I, so I can't move. I said, uh, uh, I need you to take me to MSA. I've called our church member. 
who works at MSA, and so he says, come on. So Abbott, uh, okay, he's looking for me to get up. <laughs> I can't get up. So he pulls his truck in front of the yard, and, 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 and you know how, you, how your parents tell you when you leave home you ought to be dressed up because you don't ever know how you're going to go? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's 11 o'clock, but I've not gotten out of my pajamas, and I'm not in the best pajamas, and I ain't fully dressed nowhere. <laughs> and so I'm contemplating going, well, I'm going to try to change clothes. I go to the doctor, half naked, in my worst raggedy pajamas. I can't get anything off and can't get anything on, so I go like I am. Just like I am, and, and they're looking at me, because I'm, I'm telling you now, I was a hot mess. <laughs> but at that point, I didn't care. And so Albert literally picks me up, and we hop, and he gets me in the truck, and and so Diane gets home by the time we get in the truck, and she all horrified. And then, and then they take me to Abbott called Ernest, and so Ernest meet us up there at the MSA. And then when I tell you, whatever was keeping the pain off that pain come back, and, and I done cried and just did everything up there. And I feel like I can't get up because they do the x-ray, and you're talking about they were turning me to do those x-rays, and, and this thing was locked up, and I was crying. And then they come back and tell me, we've never seen a fracture like yours where yours is. And then my member, my doctor friend, looks at me and tells me, it's going to take me about nine weeks uh, of rehab, and then I got to learn how to walk all over again. And I'm just, oh, Lord, I've fallen, and I can't get up. But this is when it shifted for me, when I knew I had to get up. And, and so the doctor writes this prescription for all this medical supply stuff. And, uh, and you know, Abbott fast. He had, he had Ernest and Diane, they, 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 they real fast. So they get together. And so I'm, they get me home. I'm in pain. Then they start bringing this stuff in the house. They bring a wheelchair. They bring crutches. And the walker, I'm moving pretty good. Then they brought that portable toilet in there. <laughs> I said, no. No. That ain't going to happen right there. When I saw that portable toilet, all kind of images ran through my head. And I said, Lord, I have fallen, but you got to get me up from here. And then the, uh, the medical supplies folk called. And so I said, uh, they said, uh, Mr. Simmons. And so I'm trying to keep Diane from it. I said, yes. <laughs> they said, we got your stuff and we get it. Don't bring it over here. <laughs> Is this Daniel Simmons? Yeah, he don't need that stuff. Don't bring it over here. <laughs> and then they, I said, ma'am, I told you, don't you bring that stuff over here. Because <laughs> at that time, I, I just decided I had to get up. Didn't know how, but there was a shift in my mind, and looking at that toilet did it. I didn't use it either. <laughs> I found a way. And, 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 and what I'm trying to say to you is, um, at some point, you have to make a shift when you fall. Not if you fall, but when you fall, that you're not going to stay down. We don't have the option to say, help, I've fallen and can't get up. I have fallen, but I will get up. And, and, and that has nothing to do with positive thinking. But it has everything to do with the promise of a living God. That you, 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 you will fall, but you will get up again. And, and Psalm 37, 23, 24 tells us why we will get up again. And then when I get to verse 24, I'm going to show you who I'm talking about here in terms of who and how we fall. But verse 23 must be understood before you can claim the promise of verse 23. Verse 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. 
and he delighted in his way. That says to us that um, a good man, not every man or every woman, but only the good man and the good woman has their steps ordered by the Lord. Not every person can claim verse 24. But it's only the good man or the good woman whose steps are established, guided, directed, kept in place by the Lord. And that person delights himself in the Lord, and the Lord delights himself in that person. David, who's believed to be the writer of this psalm, when he wrote it, a good man or woman is a person who was made good by obeying the law. But in this dispensation that we're in, the dispensation of grace, what you and I need to understand that we are not good by obeying the law. But we are good through the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. What, what do you mean, Pastor? According to God's word, none of us could be good based on law because nobody could live up to the whole letter of the law. And the failure to live up to any point of the law made you guilty of all the law. That's the way it was written. And so I, I, I might have passed the killing, the murder, the fornication, the adultery, but if I was jealous or envious or covetous, then it made me guilty of all of it. And so we are good because of the finished work of Christ. Here it is. Because Jesus came, lived a sinful life, a sinless life, and the sinless life that he lived, he lived vicariously for us, which means he was living a sinless life for us because his sinless life was credited to every believer who puts their trust in him. Make it plain, Pastor. So the life that Jesus lived, he lived on our behalf. And if you will, you and I had an account with God. And on our account, there were deficits because we fell short. But we got credit for the life that Jesus lived rather than the life we lived. And so he, he came and he lived a sinless life and we got credit for it. But here's the other thing. All the sin that we committed would ever commit, he also went to the cross. Hung, bled, and died and paid for our sins and so we are made right because all of our sins have been paid for, taken care of, and then we have credit for a righteous life. Now, now, now anybody who say God has never done anything for them, you, you, you must understand what it took for God to make you good. And so that's the first half. Now, here's the second half of the good person. And so now that we know... That, that, that the righteousness of Christ is credited to us now that we know that our sins have been paid for us then comes into play what Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 then walk worthy of the vocation where we have been called which means now that I am saved now that I have been made right by Jesus now what I want to do is try to live right because of what he's done for me I don't live right to get right I live right out of the fact that I've already been made right. I want to live up to my name. What's my new name? I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the king, so I want to live like a child of God, live like the son of a king. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and so they're the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace. We want to live all of that out. So if you and I fall in that category, and again, even as we live out the righteousness that's in us and try to do good, we're still going to fall short. But thank God the blood of Christ covers that. Yes, yes, yes. But we don't wallow in it. We get up and we try to move beyond that. We ask for forgiveness. We repent and we change and we move on. And every day, life ought to get a little better. And so you and I can declare that this verse 23 represents us not because we have lived the perfect life, but because of what Jesus has done for us and so because we are good, he orders our steps. Where you going, Simmons? I don't know. The Lord is ordering my steps. Where you going, Brother Jones? I don't know because the Lord is ordering my steps. 
Why are you walking, living like you're living? I don't know. It's, it's, it's the Lord who orders my steps. And I, and, and I allow him to order my steps because he is my Lord. See, he, he, he could have said the steps of a good man are ordered by Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. But he didn't use that word. He used the word Lord, which means master. He's the master, and so he orders our steps. And he delights in the way that we go. And if he delights in it, we ought to delight in it too. All right, now, so now that we know who he's talking about, verse 24 says, though that good man falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholded him with his hand. Let me read something to you here from a commentary about this, this falling piece uh, so I make it real plain for you. It comes from this commentator, gentleman by the name of Barnes, uh, called Barnes Notes on the Scripture. And it says, as he explains, verse 24, though he fall, that is, though he is sometimes disappointed, Though he is not always successful, though he may be unfortunate, yet this will not be final ruin. The word here does not refer to his falling into sin, but into misfortune, disappointment, reverses, calamities. The image is that of a man who is walking alone on a journey, but who stumbles or falls to the earth, a representation of one who is not always successful, but who finds that disappointment springs up in his path. And even though it springs up, he shall not utterly be cast down. The word here means thrown down at full length, to be prostrate, to be cast out, to be thrown away. Let me, let me back up and just highlight a couple things here. For those of us who are children of God, for those of us who are walking in life's journey, listen, sometimes you will fall in that you will be disappointed. And those disappointments can come from any direction. And when they come, they leave us broken. They leave us fallen. And I know right now I'm talking to people in front of me in this sanctuary and those who are listening to me virtually, your life when you look back over the path that you've come, what you see, and you don't have to pretend with me because I'm looking at mine too, there are plenty of disappointments. There are children who disappointed you. Don't mean you, don't, you, you stop loving them, but, but, but you've been disappointed by your children. You've been disappointed by your spouse, your significant other, by life, by your career. You thought it was going to be one way, but you discovered that something happened and it didn't turn out like you wanted, and you see disappointment all in your path. And sometimes you've been disappointed with yourself. I know I have. Said I wasn't going to do that. But I did it anyway. And after I did it, I was disappointed with myself. Not always been successful. You planned some stuff. You did some stuff. And the stuff you did, you did all the right things. But still, in spite of those efforts, you were not successful. That business didn't succeed. That, that, that job you thought you were entitled to, you, you didn't get. And it really hurts you when the people who got it or the person who got it didn't come close to being as qualified as you are because you went and got all the credentials, all of the specifications, the requirements, and yet you got looked over wasn't successful and you lost money and you put time and energy into it but no success and then you look down the road and this person who is just getting on your last nerve they seem to be successful unfortunate all this these reverses in life calamities and in the past few months we've seen the reverses we've seen the calamities We've been living in it. But what this verse here reminds us of 
is that when you fall, you will not be utterly cast down. Let me read something else to you. Said here it means this calamity falling down. Here it means that he would not be utterly and finally prostrate. He would not fall so that he could not rise again. The calamity would be temporary. The reversal temp temporary. The disappointment, the failure temporary. And there would be ultimate prosperity. And that's what I want to say to you today to give you some hope. Even though you may have fallen and you're living in that fallenness right now, it is only temporary. Keep hope alive. It won't last forever. That reversal will be turned around. That calamity will become a part of your testimony. You see, to have a testimony, you got to have a test. And when this calamity, when this pandemic is all over, when these financial crises we are going through and we'll go through, when it's all over, the saints going to have a testimony. Like everybody else, we would have fallen. But our testimony will be, I failed, but I got up again. Not that I failed and couldn't get up, but I got up. In that commercial, they want you to buy that little thing you put around your neck and you press it. And the emergency comes, so that's why they help. But in this text today, help, you got to know where your help come from. Because if you're going to get up again, you got to know that it's not in you. Look at verse 24 again. So though we fall, we won't be utterly cast down. And here is why. For the Lord, the same Lord in verse 23 that asked you to let him establish your steps, he upholded you with his hand. Uphold it. You fall. But he limits how far you fall. You fall. But even when you fall, he still got you. And you will rise again because he's the one that helps you. And if you notice what the text says, he upholded you with his hand. And the hand of God is a symbol of the power of of God. Check that hand out. We, we sing a song. He got the whole world in his hand. And so his hand then is big enough to hold all of us. And there are two, two reasons that you ought to rejoice that his hand. First of all, it means there's room for you. And so whatever your situation is, whatever the reason for your failure, God got you in his hand. There's room for you in God's hand. And because he got the whole world, you and me, brother, in his hand, you, you don't have to fret over other people because if God got them in his hand too, it doesn't mean he don't have room for you. So you can rejoice that there's room for you, but there's also room for other folk because we tend to have a scarcity mentality and worry that if I'm going to get some help, I got to keep other folk from getting some help because it's only so much. And if they're getting some, it might not be enough left for me. But in God's hand, it's big enough for all of us. And I pray and I hope the world gets to the place where we understand we don't have to fight and fuss over resources. We don't have to be cutthroats. But in the hand of God, there is room for all of us. When I was a little boy, I, I used to eat a lot and I was greedy. And, 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 and because in my mind there was a scarcity of food, I'd be the first to the table. And I'd be eating so fast because my goal is to beat those other jokers in the house through and go back to seconds before they do. Because in my mind, if, if, if they get through first, they're going back and won't be enough left for me. And can I tell you that I brought that mentality into life be, before the Lord changed me trying to get mine before somebody else got theirs? And I say that because I'm not the only one in here like that. But let God deliver you from that because his hand is so big, there's room. But listen at this. Again, it's the symbol of the power of God. 
And God's power, God's hand is strong enough to hold you up and to pick you up. And that ought to be a source of comfort as we go through whatever it is we're going through, as we've fallen down in various ways in the, in the disappointments and the, in, in the failure when things have not been successful and calamities and reversals, I don't ever lose hope because I know that in my own strength, I'm not strong enough, wise enough, big enough to pull myself back. But the power of God, he's strong enough to hold us up. And then when he get ready, he's strong enough to pick us back up again. And can I tell you, there's nothing you're going through that's overwhelming to God. God's power surpasses any obstacle, any trial, you may be facing right now. But what you've got to do is just trust God. I was on the phone with somebody this, this week and they were overwhelmed because their blood pressure has skyrocketed. All of this stress and stuff that we're going through and this person is going through, the numbers are just crazy. And they, and, 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 and they are waiting to see a specialist and, and she's probably listening to me now. But what I want to tell you is in God's hand. His hand is bigger than blood pressure. And he'll hold you up. And then he'll pick you up and give you recovery from that stress and hypertension you're dealing with because there's that much power in his hand. And in this sanctuary today, hear me loud and clear. Whatever it is, God is bigger than that. Some of you are concerned and worried because this unemployment stuff is going to run out after a while. And you're wondering how you're going to make it. And, and then some of us didn't, get, didn't even get that. It's already gone. Whatever it is we have. But let me tell you something. God's hand. He's bigger than any financial calamity you could consider. I'm a living witness. God will hold you up. And then when God gets ready, he'll pick you up. I thank God I've been through some tests. So I got a testimony. I know God will pick you up. Even when you fall way down, God is able to pick you up. Again, it represents the power of his hand. He's able to hold you up. But then he's able to pick you up. And then thirdly, God's hand. The power of his hand. That grip of God's hand. He's able to hold you. And he won't let go. And so don't you worry about being lost are cast down forever because he's able to hold all of us in his hand. He's strong enough to hold us up and then to pick us up. But here's the other thing. His grip is strong enough that he will never let us go. And I'm glad about that right there because there are friends who will let you go. There are family members who will let you go. But God won't ever let you go. Thanks for watching, be blessed, and continue walking in the light.